Hello. Hey, hi, Claire. How are you? Good, good, good to see you here. Hi there. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, Aminul sir, for, for, for participating in this session. Hi, everyone. My pleasure. Hello. Welcome to the session. Uh, before we move ahead, I have a few points for our audience to note. Uh, first, please keep your mics on mute, except for the speakers in the panel. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box, or you can raise your hands during the Q&A. Without any further ado, let's start with our first session, that is Seed to Scale, building an EgTech company from ground zero. EgTech, the wave of emerging technologies such as robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, biotechnology, all coming to food and agriculture is increasingly creating opportunities for investors, entrepreneurs, farmers, and consumers. To explore this and help us build an EgTech company, we have expert panel consisting of Claire Prabula, Managing Director, the Yield Lab Asia Pacific. As the MD, she looks at capitalizing on impactful sustainable technologies towards the food and agricultural production chain. She has been recognized as a pioneer and change agent skilled in delivering significant increases in profitability by leveraging business synergies and innovation to build new companies and corporate lines of business. Claire has extensive business background in new lines of business, sales organizations, and strategic initiatives across Asia Pacific and Europe. Our next speaker is Emmanuel Murray, Senior Advisor, Cap uh, Caspian Impact Investments Advisor Private Limited. Emmanuel has over 36 years of rich and varied experience in agriculture, rural credit, and microfinance including five years as head of operations of an impact focus NBFC with a portfolio of over 6 billion Indian rupees. He has published over 150 papers and reports and is currently working to build the food and agri startup ecosystem. He takes special interest in working with small and emerging institutions and projects with unstructured businesses. Our next and last speaker is Mandar Mahatre, CEO, India, Apex uh, Fund Services. Mandar is an experienced leader with expertise in growing and in institutionalizing organizations. He is a passionate teacher and mentor and also a public, uh, published author. As a strategic thinker, he is highly focused on execution, growth, risk reduction, and talent development. He also has functional expertise in wholesale banking strategy, uh, merger and acquisition, joint ventures, valuation, business or project management, and client, client planning. This pa panel of our expert speakers will be moderated by Deepak Parikh, the Managing Director and Chief Consultant of Honeybee Tech Incubations Private Limited. I welcome you all on board. Over to you, Deepak. Thank you. So thanks, thanks, everyone, for this very interesting session. We will be talking about something which is dream of every entrepreneur when he starts his journey to take his organization from seed to scale. We are having a term unicorn very loosely being thrown away, thrown at the, today, right? Whenever we talk about the, the successful startups, when you see that success for a startup is about creating value for the customer and scalability and scalability is what we'll be talking today. And we are having a panel of very eminent guests today who have been there, done it, supported organization, understood the DNA of those entrepreneurs who have been able to take their companies from ground zero to where they are already serving millions of farmers or billions of customers. I would start with you, Claire. We would like to understand a little bit more about the work you are doing. The Yield is like, you know, is an organization which everybody looks with a lot of pride because you have been part of creating tens and tens of awesome startups in this sector. And I would like to understand how you approach this support to startups so that like, you know, you have been able to have such a good hit ratio. Floor is your clear. Thank you, Deepak, and happy Saturday to everybody. Thank you, Vizek and, and uh, Honey, Honey B for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate on this panel. Um, just to, in, in order to answer 
Deepak's question, maybe I just say a few words about what the Yield Lab does, um, and then and then my my answers are in better context. So we're we're an early stage seed and Series A uh, venture capital fund. Um, I'm managing director for the Yield Lab Asia Pacific. Uh, we have funds uh, in the U.S., uh, North America, Europe, Latin America, and now Asia Pacific registered at the end of 2019. Um, so we're, we call ourselves a federation of funds. What we do is early, we call it late early stage investment, which is really poor English, but it connotes a meaning, which is that we're looking for innovation that um, is registratable or patentable. All of us come out of the industry. So, um, and, and our network of subject matter experts of what we do uh, is hundreds uh, globally that we can access around whatever science area or, or business area. And that's kind of the key to our success, we have globally 57 um, in ag tech investments um, at the seed and Series A level, um, and we hope to want to follow on invest with those seed stage. And, and what we do is we, in helping these companies get through that valley of death to the other side, if it's an early stage seed investment, is that we have, I hate to use the word accelerator because it's become um, a, a term that is, is it seems very finite. And what we do is very bespoke. Um, it's uh, a cadence that's set up between the founder and a 20, 30 year expert. And we feel that the way that we go about what we do with the deep subject matter experts in determining the innovation that we're gonna select, and then working with these companies through that year, we really never let any of them go, has been the reason for our success rate. So it's that, that subject matter expertise alignment that has um, I think has has been what's uh, provided the good returns and success with no failures in our portfolio. Super. I will have a follow-up question. Uh, are you seeing any specific innovations or areas where you believe that, like you know, the future lies in, and then where you would be more keen to support? Well, yes. I mean, there's there the great digitization of ag ag tech agriculture is underway. And for us, agriculture is crop science, precision ag, animal health, sustainability, traceability, food ingredients. So we look across all of this. There's some some areas that are um, underserved. And one, one is aquaculture, which uh, in, in many different dimensions of aquaculture, which we stimulate with a not-for-profit um, uh, challenge, which is run as an accelerator, subject matter expert alignment to stimulate that innovation. So. We're looking at some cool things from our challenge that have come out of those 180 applications. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, also, you know, the smallholder farmers in our world here in Asia Pacific, the innovation that's coming out, smoke, it's focusing on the smallholder farmer is quite compelling um, because it's a different landscape. You know, how you're monetizing your innovation is completely different than you are for a large holder solutions who can afford to pay for these things. Um, uh, and, and also, you know, looking at the, the very long supply chains that exist. Um, something, you know, blockchain and many things have been talked about in regards to supply chain. My background is supply chain for quite a long time. Uh, but yet no one has really been able to crack it on its head. And, but it's extremely important. You know, these smallholder farmers and also the large ones as well, um, you know, they're, they're providing the smallholders, in particular 70% of the, the world's calories and produce and yet they can't get it to its final destination. Um, so being able to have technology that can enable um, the farm to fork that the consumer wants, but also to be, make sure that uh, everybody, all the constituents of the supply chain get something from this innovation. The insurance providers, those that are selling the claims, the producers, nobody wants to have the finger pointed to them that they're the cause of the problem. You wanna be able to know who it is that's responsible for the produce not getting there or not coming in the shape or form that it should be. And also to, to be able to finance the, the trade. So having innovation that can do all of that in one go is quite compelling. Perfect, super awesome. And this is where I believe like, you know, those who are in the audience who are the prospective uh, innovators and uh, having uh, dreamy eyes, look at agriculture with a little bit of pinch of salt. There are a lot of things happening, but at the same time, as Claire mentioned, like, you know, there are a lot of challenges, right? And those challenges where I believe, like, you know, I would like to take help of Emmanuel, sir, and understand a little bit more with, with his diverse experience and understanding, especially in uh, rural economics. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Please uh, uh, 
share your views insights introduction whatever you mean like you know okay. uh, i would have loved to jump in the audience rather than being on the <laughs> monitor panel hearing to your, your the, the body of work you have done is just phenomenal so please thank you thank you so much uh, mr parekh and uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel today uh, i think uh, agricultural uh, innovations in the agriculture space in india uh, have been slow in coming most of the work was in the public sector for a very long time and uh, for whatever reasons i think uh, young people also did not show great interest but all this has changed over the last 5 to 6 years with large numbers there are today over a thousand uh, agri startups in india at a certain scale there are more than i think 5000 people Uh, working in various ways in agri space that i know of and at least a thousand startups and uh, some of them i think 20 to 30 gain a lot of visibility but the significant number which are still working in that space and it's not a easy uh, game to play undoubtedly uh, two things that i could say about uh, agriculture innovations and startups is one you know the connect between agri and tech is something very close so if you have technology that is built in a lab uh, how are you going to take it to the farmers is a large question so that is where uh, there is a disconnect between the two which continues to exist the second is a large amount of the money and capital has flown to uh, what uh, we would call the low hanging fruit or farm to fork kind of businesses and that may be the efficiency is possible and the results we can get could be quick but the areas that have been neglected are basically uh, resource efficiencies uh, in terms of water resources in terms of inputs uh, reducing uh, drudgery uh for farming uh, labor and farmers themselves sustainability these are issues i think where uh, there have been uh, relatively less focus among the agri startups farm machinery for example uh tailored for small farmers is something that needs a more, much more attention than is required there's a huge labor shortage again in agriculture although we have a large population uh and that makes agriculture unviable for a small farmer so how do we address that is another issue of course uh, traceability and uh, uh, the related aspects of let's say warehousing storage uh, farm level processing these are also issues that require attention overall another thing i think uh, entrepreneurs or young people who enter jump into this space Uh, learn after a few years is that agri startups is a long term game so you're not going to have uh, immediate successes it's going to two, take 2 two to 3 years to understand first of all and it may take 5 to 6 years for actually being successful in that space uh, not to discourage anybody it's a place full of action but the structurally indian farming is all about small farmers and therefore uh, solutions from the west may not directly work in india and need to be uh, tailored to the indian context uh, thanks with that i'll take a break no no sure sir but we are not going to give you break uh, I'll, I'll, i'll 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 be putting a context context around um, actually we do a lot of research on startup ecosystem across the globe as honey bee so yeah. we have evaluated ecosystem in uh, australia uh, in us predominantly in california because that's where the real real things happen right as well as uh, in in israel and in south southeast asia in, right. including like you know in india we found couple of things which are very like you know i'll say that based on the economy are covering different for example california you find that more than 38% of the founders are phd's mm. right you move to australia it is around uh, 22% mm. you move to israel it again goes to what to 40 45% right netherlands is like in you know, a sub of 50% mm. when you come back to south south east asia suddenly you find that actually like it goes actually in single digit do you also see that actually like in you know, reliance on uh, the real research work to 
before getting into entrepreneurship also is one of the reason that we are having too many numbers but not too much of scale uh, absolutely i think i think that's a very valid point uh, that uh, a lot of people in the it sector and in the technology space have come into actech uh, without being grounded and uh, we should not uh, take away the credit from them or the discourage them but they need to spend maybe a year in the on the ground understanding agriculture before actually so there's uh, uh, solutions running after problems rather than the other way around so uh, very important to connect uh, with institutions on the ground research institutions also and that is where i think all these incubators accelerators uh, need to hand hold uh, uh, these entrepreneurs who are very uh, let's say full of energy uh, excited to do things uh, but need direction and need that wisdom uh, which those years of research the scientists and the academics and uh, agri institutions bring so bringing that connect is very important at the moment it's missing uh, but it is something and i think because of that scalability has been an issue uh, iterations in trying to customize it is an issue uh, revenue streams is a big issue you know who's going to pay for your solution is asked much later than while you're developing the solution so these are all questions that are contextual to india and that is why i think a large number of actechs are still not as big as we wish they would be no i totally agree with you sir i am the best example of that i started i was a tech guy written books on uh, advanced technology suddenly in 2016 thought let's do something in social impact got into ag tech right. uh, first 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 after 3 months i believe that i have created a tinder for farmers which will give solve all their problems launched in indonesia totally failed Mm -hmm. Farmer said, "That's this is total crap, right?" <laughs> so the first lesson was that, uh, like you know, uh, you have to do more learning. I went back on drawing board, started visiting countries, so from Indonesia to Philippines. I've been with thousands of farmers. I've done harvest, understood the pain problem, and after one year, we had solution which was actually was appreciated by, like you know, from World Economic Forum to UNDP to everyone. So that I, I strongly believe with you that, like in case you don't understand agriculture already, please all your youngsters who are having this. view of being in ectech please look at go to ground get your hands in soil i'll never say that it's getting your hands dirty because soil is beautiful thing i right. go back to clear clear actually there has been a lot of uh, talk in uh, specifically your uh, part of the world especially singapore mm. of proteins plant grown proteins like suddenly i saw 200 million in seed funding now right you know that's 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 something super awesome So, uh, i would like to understand a little bit more about you like you know from the perspective of bioag that where do you see like you know in 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 advanced market especially like you know whether we talk about singapore malaysia and other part of the world specifically north america how do you see that picking up and and what's your view for, as a e lab on, on and that those type of innovations you talk about it on on the alternative protein space in particular is that yes, what yes, yes, about? Yes, oh, okay well yes. first 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 Uh, if i can just uh respond to something that that uh emmanuel said which was um uh, about the about the level of innovation i mean it's really good that there's an uptick in 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 alternative proteins is one of them um from an ag tech innovation perspective but just the context for the listener in that you know in q1 of 2021 there were um you know more more ag tech deals than ever Uh, early stage 380 go in you know if you just look at uh north america let's just take north america but compare that against the internet uh vc space of investments made it was um 25000 so you know so it's still ag tech is still rather small in re in relation to where venture capital funding is going um uh so when you see these upticks around like alternative proteins absolutely and singapore is quite strong in this regard because a uh, Singapore it's an amazing place to be based out of um the government has some amazing programs that are focused on the 30 and 30 initiative to be 30% self sufficient um you know uh in 30 30 years and the focus is around aquaculture around alternative proteins culture meat and and uh controlled environment agriculture so so that in itself creates a stimulation um and success breeds success right so you've seen some amazing valuations happening so 
Um, it's causing more companies to come into alternative proteins. Uh, as far as our view, it's, it's a food ingredient and a, a food play that's one of our pillars and it's very important. Um, but we also know that to, you know, to get to, there's a lot that has to go into creating alternative proteins. So, you know, it doesn't, it's not void of crops <laughs> challenges. It's not void of mycotoxins on food. It's not void of, you know, all these other things that have to happen before you can even create um, these, these um, business to, to consumer solutions. So we're the Yield Lab, we're looking at all of it. Um, and, and, and that is one component, um, and, and as, as we are also looking at, at cellular meat, but we're also looking at animal health. We're also looking at, you know, uh, of the fast growing protein, which is uh, the aquaculture uh, space um, and, and, you know, the, the, the inefficiencies that still exist there. And I think for those listeners that are looking at the innovation, as Deepak mentioned, you know, you need to understand the industry and you need to understand it in a very, um, uh, deep sense uh, in regards to your innovation on what kind of impact you're going to have to that particular area of agriculture and how measurable is that impact? What's the total addressable market? There are so many things that, you know, I could go down a list that, that you know, we want to see when we're talking to a, an innovator or a company that's looking for funding. Uh, get another question like, you know, you are uh, in uh, typically C, pre-seed and series A sort of environment. When the organizations or the, the innovators, they move to the next level, right? Series B, C and even going to the IPO. What 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 uh, type of, uh, I'll say that the specific characteristics we have seen for those companies which are able to take the leap ahead and jump over the series B, right? And and, and what's, what's, do you see that like, you know, those uh, audience who are sitting here, should keep in mind when even when they're starting building of their company um well i i think you have to look at where you're going to go where you want to end up um i like a manual say you know walk before you run figure out you know have a very compelling value proposition know that you're going to be in it for a long haul and this is not um ag tech innovation is is not something that's going to be um uh, getting to an IPO. As a matter of fact, most ag tech innovation is probably never going to go public. It's going to be acquired. But you're not looking at a, at a quick uh, two to three years and uh, you'd be lucky. It'd be extremely lucky. Um, there's no immediate exit. Um, it takes time. You got to plan for it. And so you got to plan for becoming cash positive. You've got to plan for being a business that's going to have a long runway. Um, and then well, as you go, you're raising funds and you're you're, you're moving up uh, in regards to getting follow-on investment, but you've got to be a compelling business and you can't skip, there's no easy button. You can't skip over and, and uh, just, just go to a value, high valuation. You've got to do the hard work. You've got to get an innovation that's got a long runway. You've got to figure out how you're going to scale that innovation. Um, how are you going to make it repeatable? Um, what are the reoccurring revenue streams? You're going to have to figure out your go-to-market strategy. You know, you're going to have to 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 look at you know how you're going to be able to um, take whether your your solution is complex and get it to where it's a little bit more repeatable or monetizable. You're going to have to figure out how to extend your reach range. You know, as a small company, you can't just have all direct sales. You've got to figure out what your channel strategy is. I mean, this is not for the for the week, right? <laughs> You've got to you're building a company. You're not building an exit. You're building a company that's going to have to go through the different stages that any company goes through. I've done a startup, know it, it's hard. Um, and you've got to, you, but, but it's about getting the business to stand up on its own and get to cash positive. Um, you know, hopefully you'll be able to get there, but along the way you're raising funds. And as the investor sees the level of effort that you've put in and how you, how you're going to be able to to uh, capture that total addressable market, then that's when you're going to start get seeing investors take attention and may, and 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 um, want to invest in your company. Super clear. So, audience, uh, it's very simple. Try to make your business profitable, right? So, mm -hmm. on the way, if you are profitable, you will definitely get good investors to scale it up. Now, that I would like to bring uh, Mandar. Like you know, Mandar has been a genius when it comes to like you know. Uh, trying to stitch two companies together and get them funded, helping them. So Mandar, your, your views on like, you know, how to take 
companies from seed to scale and what would be your uh, recommendations that those entrepreneurs who are going to be starting or have just started to take care of few specific things you believe are very important sure uh, so first of all my apologies for joining in late uh, you know i had just some tech issues in terms of joining so really really regret that i've been listening to claire and emmanuel uh, for quite some time and they've put really valid points around uh, what can be built and how should it be built right so uh, in my mind point number 1 when you are looking at what your consumer base is please understand your consumer base so if you are looking at uh, uh, agriculturist as your as your end consumer please understand that uh, historically that agriculturist is for, uh, using a farming practice which has been prevalent for thousands of years and they really are not going to change immediately while they'll have native intelligence in agriculture they may not be as savvy as you are when it comes to tech i mean that scenario is changing but it's not changing so rapidly that it would create a massive market right uh, a lot of innovation and a lot of uh, adoption which i have seen at least in this space is really at the end consumer end and not at the agriculture end right? so what i mean by that is uh, it's the end consumer which is looking at a different way of supply chain so that's that's where direct to uh, farm to direct home companies have tried uh, you know or it is change in the way a specific substance protein has been used or end used in terms of organic products right so it's very important to understand who your consumer is while you are looking to build and what is that adoption rate with your consumer please don't expect any agriculturist to change their farming methods overnight if you are looking at that specific segment then in all probability you yourself need to be a celebrity farmer meaning you know you've taken a, a 50 acre farm and uh, instead of uh, generating x on that farm you are able to now generate uh, 20x and then you go and propound that methodology everywhere and everybody very quickly laps to it if you are not you know you are essentially an outsider in that ecosystem and that's what you would be looked from from that perspective so very important to validate that idea to think through it and right? very important to go and observe what's really happening you know just sit with the farmers really understand what is their pain point and then work on those pain points if you don't do that uh, you know you're probably building something which nobody is going to use uh, so that in itself you know and in in many of the uh, of the tech startup that point reach is reach much much quicker you know you probably reach that point in 3 to 6 months or in the worst scenario a year but uh, but in agriculture i think and i broadly classify agriculture including livestock and and uh, fisheries and poultry all of those right in agriculture that point probably just takes much much longer so your initial phase is long you need to be prepared for it in lot of cases the investors will just kind of test you they will give you uh, uh, very vague answers they'll they'll be happy for your progress but they'll not be excited enough to invest in you so that's number point number 1 secondly as you start to get and as you start to solve for the right problem the question then becomes of how do you start to look to scale up you know what are the channels do you use do you start to kind of become a local monopoly in a small locality or in a small area where your startup is set up and then do you look to replicate that model everywhere else you know what are your sales channels who are your advisors are you also looking to add to more products uh, while you are doing that and these are some of the things which you will start to look and as you make progress that's when the investors will start to jump in many of the smarter investors would want to avoid the very early stage risk right and and uh, many of them will just wait for some results before they jump in and uh, you know finally all the typical things which apply for startups you know uh, your co-founder risk your uh, your product risk your product market fit risk your you know if you are building some tech around it you know risk related to that those will also need to be taken care of right and and if you are able to lay down in a systematic manner all of these things which needs to be built and tight up with uh, with investor funding requirement and with the resource requirement i think then you are in a much better shape to go and raise capital than than anything else perfect perfect thanks thanks a lot munda for your views
I, I fully agree with you that like you know agriculture is a little bit a long shot, right? You have to uh, move out from that three six nine model, three months prototype, six month market validation, nine month grow up or exit, right? You get in like you know the the season itself is six months, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to validate a small thing. It, it's like you know six month goes. Absolutely. And I've I've gone through the, I've gone through that pain. Uh, fortunately, we never focused on investments. We always focused on becoming profitable. And that that uh, as you rightly said that you get very vague answer. Uh, like you know, I presented a lot of forums and uh, not for investment, but uh, definitely to like you know pitch my solution, right? And I found uh, sometime uh, the jury would say that uh, hey, you have you have too oversimplified it, and sometimes they'll say that's too complex. So mm -hmm. so you are confused that hey, I said the same thing in two different forums. I got totally different answers. Uh, I I go circle back to Emmanuel. Like you know, this is uh, I'll say that little bit of controversy, or also uh, someone with your. Uh, understanding would be able to elaborate when you see an uh, venture capital arm of uh, agriculture development bank investing in totally different sort of uh, startups and then you are having like you know some of the modern uh, venture capital capitalists who have invested in totally different sort of uh, startups not the million dollar question for an entrepreneur is that actually which side i should take right uh, should i go to conservative uh, uh, let's try to make profit and my profit will ensure investment or i come with a like you know big bang idea and say that like you know i want to raise a million dollar in uh, uh, angel itself so that i can create a business worth a billion dollars in 3 years where, mm -hmm. where do you see like you know the, the startup should be or the entrepreneur should be thinking about i <laughs> i really do not uh, have an answer for that uh, <laughs> but uh, from where we come Emmanuel, as... Emmanuel, you, you know there is a civil war going on that direction today yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so let me uh, talk about our position as right. caspian or uh, me as an individual uh, we believe in what you were saying you know a solution that is profitable and scales in a way that the farmer can afford that solution also so we are more at the farmer end of the chain uh, less at the other end the consumer end and uh, from experience so far uh, very very few businesses in the agri space or the ag techs are profitable today the biggest of the big also are not profitable and there is no sight of profitability also we really don't know unless they keep getting multiple rounds of capital uh, when they can burn out is a question mark so that is not the way we believe sustainable businesses can be built in our view at a gross level you need to have a margin on every unit that you sell or every unit of service that you provide and that to us is the right way to do things uh, with i think the zomato ipo and many others <laughs> coming uh, the uh, thesis is being reversed so actually we may be old school <laughs> there may be a new way of doing business which uh, we don't know but uh, where we have put our money again what we talk and what we say uh, we have put our money on at least 30 agri businesses uh, half of them have not even today raised capital from vcs or pe funds but we believe these guys are the seriously long term players who are doing business in a manner that even if the next round of capital doesn't come they would continue to grow and they are relevant for the indian context so in those kind of businesses we are putting money uh, we don't have the kind of deep pockets to put money into large businesses that are burning cash infinitely perfect emmanuel i and i understand and uh, as you rightly said like you know even the 10 year or 11 year old companies in india like you know if you still see they are so weak on their uh, unit economics right absolutely and, and absolutely I, I, I i would with, with uh, especially south southeast asian context whether we talk about indonesia philippines thailand india i would right. request all the startups who are focusing in developing world Right, please look at your unit economics from day one. Right, uh, there, there there is not sufficient cash like in in California where you would like to just burn to get one customer. So be more <laughs> more careful about it. And uh, secondly, also you see that a uh, lot of reliance on development uh, funding, right, from GIZ to Austin Aid to US Aid, DFIDs, right. They are definitely supporting. They are doing super work. 
but they'll put money in where you are doing like you know might not be feasible immediately right so please be very careful that uh, don't look at too much of grant and too much of immediate investment right look at the profitability now that brings me to the last round of questions clear we'll start with you like you know can you put some recommendation to the entrepreneurs or uh, the prospective founders and existing founders where do you would like to say three or four things they should uh, keep in mind when they start their journey or when they are on their journey to become a super company yeah uh you know first of all welcome i'm glad that that you're focusing on this space if you're an entrepreneur it's it's much needed um please you know what we do is we're we're looking for impactful innovation in innovation that's going to have a huge impact to its subsector within agriculture as Deepak mentioned everything's got a growing season so you're relying to that but you know as you're looking at your innovation how is it providing impact um measurably uh also you know from an ESG perspective start now um don't wait until an, an investor says so how are you impacting the ESG goals i mean and then have a blank look on your face so start thinking about now you know how how are you saving how is your innovation saving water how is it um improving lives um uh you know uh, investors vcs corporate institutions strategics are all going to ask this but it comes down to still some basics understand the problem you're solving i think um emmanuel mentioned this uh you know and what you're solving it for how much of the value is being produced that you're capturing within your own company and profitability if you're saving 30% let's say of a farmer's harvest how much of that are you capturing into your business be be really clear in your ability to articulate this this is so important so you know what you know and then from there you know as you have lay out to an investor and yourself what your you know what your goals are from a t total addressable market perspective how do you plan to capture that you know you need to be able to explain this very clearly and demonstrate it um, in, in what you're doing so innovation that's that's impactful um, hopefully it's impactful and registratable so uh, innovation which is going it, to be it's important to us as an investor to look for this and then then the repeatability you know how you want to be sticky you want to be you know um not with a lot of customization so that you can start to really grow and capture your addressable market um and get a recurring revenue stream um and and illustrate how you're going to go to market very clearly i mean these are just some of the things i would i would advise you to start being able to think through as you you're creating your innovation Perfect. Clear. Thanks. Thanks a lot for very pointed uh, response for because that is I believe uh, would make it very clear for innovators and uh, anybody who's from uh, uh, the startup ecosystem. Clear. They are doing awesome work uh, across the globe. Uh, the idea of inviting her here was like you know connect the dots and situate the yield lab also start taking far more exposure in India than it was in past and especially in Gujarat like in my home state. Uh, we are having a lot of innovators clear so i'll keep on uh, pinging you with a lot of uh, business <laughs> ideas of these innovators right uh, yeah. so definitely like thanks thanks a lot for for being on this panel uh, i'll i'll go to uh, mandhar next to you right uh, you have been always you you don't mince your words so like you know a uh, straight uh, recommendation to the startups uh, and 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 see to it that like you know how they can be in your radar when you are looking for mergers acquisitions and exits right uh, so you know i mean before i get on to uh, mergers acquisitions and exits right just one bit of advice to everybody who is there on this uh, on this event right unless you have passion for agriculture don't get into it simply because agtech is now booming it's a buzzword in india you know it's a it's a long play you know it's it's unlike other startups it's not an easy play it takes a lot of passion it takes a lot of effort in all probability you may not see any money for 5 years right uh, uh, and and i'm i'm not painting a, a overtly optimistic uh, or sorry overtly pessimistic picture here but that is the reality of the uh, coming back to exits mergers acquisitions see what will eventually happen is that as these startups tend to grow they will focus either on the innovation so they will be very good on the innovation side of it and the product side of it or they will end up being very good in terms of distribution side of it there it's very rare that you would find a startup which has uh, which is very good on both side of it right 
so your acquisitions and your mergers will start to happen in an area where your weakness is so you could have a a product company uh, and i'm just throwing a random example here which has figured out to modify seeds in a way that it increases your yield by 10 plus 10x right or it uh, has some way to uh, improve uh, or reduce your resource requirement while farming by a factor of 20 right those type of companies might just get acquired by the guys who got massive distribution arms with them right uh, they have got pretty much access to every single distribution point not just in the country but probably also globally though those would be really really interested right so uh, basically product and innovative companies in all likelihood uh, the interested players will be distributors would basically look at it say that hey look i can add one of these things into my portfolio and very quickly grow the sales by uh, 20 30x for for this type of an idea the other side which is the distributor side of it uh, you know you would see evolution of models there you know and and i think those companies are more of consumer tech as against agric tech the underlying product might be agriculture but they are really really consumer tech yeah. and uh, you know in the consumer tech world the playbook is very well defined now you see not just globally even now in india whether it's zomato or guys like grow which are in in fintech world or paytm right and and uh, it's matter of just then figuring out how do you build a consumer tech within the agri space those either would go into over a long period of time into a listing space or those would become very very interesting for uh, your traditional companies meaning people with traditional distribution channels so these are the two broad ways i would imagine an exit would happen uh, you know uh we are so early in the in the in the cycle on ag tech that i really don't expect any big so called ipo listing over next 5 to 7 years from this space at least in india you know globally it might still happen but uh, india have got my doubts no sure i understand totally with them with you banda like you know ipos ag tech definitely you you might be seeing again as you rightly said that uh, in supply chain innovation distribution innovation which is more related to customer there you might see at least i i, I see couple of them but as they work in agriculture domain they they love to call themselves ag tech so that that's fine that's fine totally uh, and that also gave a boost to the like you know the overall ecosystem right when you see that you know two unicorns coming from ag tech right um, maybe they are not even sorry yeah you know while you talk about supply chain and distribution innovation and and why you say that uh, that uh, they like to call themselves ag tech i still believe they are ag tech because you know they are solving a very important problem for a uh, for a agriculturist which is how do you sell your products you know you today unfortunately see situations and newspaper reports where tomato farmers would dump truck loads of tomatoes because the pricing is not right or uh, where where fruit farmers would dump their fruits right uh, so it's it's very important to build that strong supply chain for farmers right all of us are aware that essentially uh, within this segment the middlemen end up eating 80% of the value within the within the within the system and and uh, you know the unfortunate sufferers are both consumers as well as agriculturists so if somebody is able to kind of reduce that Uh, i think that in itself will be a great service to this industry and and uh, now with technology available and now with uh, playbooks available in other areas it's just matter of now uh, you know not really even innovating copying the innovations from other areas and building it up very quickly no surely mandar will catch you on this offline because mm-hmm. i have totally different views on what you just said <laughs> on of middlemen middlemen make actually agriculture sustainable without them like you know you, you won't be able to do anything so uh, we will have this you offline know, <laughs> I, 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 i have counter views because we have lack of time there is i would have continue on that uh, emmanuel like you know in in couple of minutes your recommendation to the startup and the innovators yeah i i would uh, still i think let people enter and try their hands So I would not discourage anybody to get into this space. If you're excited about it, uh, please make a try. And I think uh, there is quite a bit of capital in terms of government programs, uh, incubators giving grants for you to do those early experiments, and then see if this is the space for you uh, to work in. And uh, I see a large number of uh, solutions from India. especially on both the service side 
and the technology side like traceability or testing quality uh, these going global because i think we can offer solutions at a quarter of the price which any american or israeli startup can offer with as good or better efficiency and uh, that is where we'll see a great deal of uh, innovations happening uh, uh, very successfully in india uh, the other innovations that are happening is across the value chain so there would be a transformation in some of these i think we are seeing it in meat and these places in a bigger way but other value chains also like seri culture dairy has also seen quite a bit of uh, innovation due to startups but other value chains also poultry uh, will see a uh, transformational change in terms of uh, quality in terms of traceability in terms of uh, hygiene and all these relevant factors which will add to both productivity uh better returns to farmer and making that particular activity itself more viable for uh, more people to venture into and i think the small farmer focus has to remain so indian agriculture will be a small farmer uh, ecosystem and we need to uh, things may not uh, automatically happen in that space funds will not flow there to an extent i think uh, impact investors like us have to devote more time there even if the returns are lower and that's our interest yeah thanks so much for having me on the panel no i mean like you know, I, i strongly believe that uh, uh, small holder farmer has to be at the center of whatever we are doing especially in developing world there are no two doubts about that livelihood is as important as the food security Absolutely. so with that i would thank all the panelists uh, on this panel uh, harshidi i think we have not overshot time by too much uh, from yeah, you that's fine but can we take this one question we already have it on screen okay what are the innovations needed to promote uh, aeroponics agriculture practices in urban and uh, peri urban regions okay now that's a very interesting question uh, like you know uh, let me try my hand on that because we have worked on hydroponics and those type of things see definitely like you are able to shorten the cost to deliver to the urban area right that helps a lot but whether do any of the control environment technology whether we talk about hydroponics aeroponics ecophonics you name it right there comes with a lot of investment and then you have to be very clear that actually you're going to just keep on going herbs and spinach and then like you know be profitable right so still i say that uh, the, the the jury is out definitely you see a lot of innovation happening in singapore and in in dubai when it comes to like you know millions of dollars are being invested in these vertical farms india i'll say that still in nascent stage looks interesting but i'll say that we are having close to i'll say 40 plus agro climatical zone let's grow everything outside <laughs> that's my view on that thank you thank you so much thank you thank you so much you know thank thanks you. deepak lovely to meet you claire and emmanuel uh, thank, thank you, you amanda thank, thank you emmanuel yes. uh, have a good rest of your saturday uh, thank you for joining uh, us and having this thoughtful discussion backstage. thank you so much we'll thank see you, you. back thanks bye bye Bye. Okay.